That was me uh, invoking my John Oliver, by the way. I didn't do the, but that was it. Um, hi, uh, I'm Chris, Jazz Sequence on the Internet. Uh, to my side, I think this direction, to my right, is uh, Mr. Gary Kovar, Binary Gary, who, uh, in all seriousness, usually we, we make up fake titles, but Gary actually, uh, not himself, but uh, his partner, uh, just gave birth to their to a child, so he's uh, congratulations to Gary um, for being a dad again. And uh, we also have our beloved Allison, who neither plays a shrew on TV nor is a shrew in real life. Um, so uh, this is Binary Jazz. It is the show where uh, Allison gives us a topic. And then we talk about the topic, and we don't know what the topic is before we start recording. Uh, and then at some point, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes quite a bit into recording, we don't know the topic either. <laughs> That's true. It's true. Uh, and then at some point at the end, we answer questions that are either submitted or uh, come out of Allison's brain. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I, I would like to actually. Uh, shout out to today we're today is international women's day uh and i just wanted to say that uh because i think it's cool and important to uh acknowledge uh the amazing women that that are in our lives and that we work with and and etc and we have an amazing woman on our show and so i'm acknowledging uh <laughs> allison as being our resident amazing woman yay thank you <laughs> agreed <laughs> Yay for amazingness. Yes, very much. Let's so. jump in and see what you think of this week's topic. Uh, this week's topic is, da -da 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 -da, drum roll, the Pygmalion effect. The chameleon effect? Pygmalion. Pygmalion. P-Y-G-M-A-L-I-O-N. Pygmalion effect. <laughs> so it has to do with pygmies, right? It, it, it would, you would, one would think that it has to do with pygmies in some variety because that is part of the word i would assume this is one of those things where like half the show is a test to see if we can figure out what the word is <laughs> i'm always so disappointed in myself um when i <laughs> pulls up a topic and I'm like, wow that's like i feel like i should know something about this topic <laughs> I don't. What it I is. never feel like I should know anything about anything. That's that's where you go wrong, Gary. You feel like you should know things. <laughs> so the chameleon effect is um, something not I can chameleon. talk at length about. Not, not chameleon. <laughs> I did have one uh, acquaintance point out to me that she was just like, it's really an interesting concept because basically it's like they're trying to mansplain to you when they don't actually know <laughs> but, they, but they know, but they know that they don't know. She's like, it's very meta. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> well, actually, one of these, one of these weeks, I will. We missed the title for the show. Mansplain. Well, actually, <laughs> one of these yeah. weeks, though, I'm convinced I'm gonna bring something, and you'll just both be like, well, obviously. <laughs> It's like, you'll know, but like, I also know things about you both that I know, like a space thing. I'm like, I know to stay clear, a soccer thing, <laughs> too easy. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Like if I was like nutmeg, like I'd just be like, that's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Then we would be talking about. So it, it'll be really things. interesting when you find out what that thing is. Um, like, wow. Why do you know so much about that? It's yeah. <laughs> going to be fun. I'm going to stumble on these niches any week now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 13th million effect. Um, well, I think Chris is probably onto something with the root word. Pigum. Um. <laughs> <laughs> From the Latin. <laughs> <laughs> From the Esperanto root. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the the problem is um, that that while I I I you know know that there are pygmy animals and pygmy uh, tribes, I don't really know what the word pygmy means. So that doesn't help me at all either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was mean, actually just thinking that like like pygmy tribe pygmy the animal definition as you said that like that I don't think there's what's how is the correlation between those two? Uh, is are they really small? What's the, what's the similarity? Is that what it means? That they're really small, like pygmy horses are really small horses. So, so pygmy people are small people. I don't know where it connects to the. Tra- so the pygmalion. <laughs> so so pygmalion effect is the effect of the... like being really small genetically, having genetically small. No, no, genes. that you don't like expand beyond like the space you have available, right? So if I'm a fish in a tank, like I don't overgrow my tank. I stop growing at a certain point. Pygmalion effect. So in converse, if you put that fish into space, <laughs> then this fish would just continue to expand forever. And soon Ra- very, and- well, not forever. It would expand very rapidly. Why, and then there would be no more fish. <laughs> <laughs> it expand rapidly until, until fish pieces would be expanding. And that's sure. why we don't have fish in space. <laughs> the only reason. I feel like you're my mom. <laughs> like, that is why you don't take fish to space, young man. <laughs> And that's why you always leave a note. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you went there. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what was the, that for I you? I really adore seeing where you both take these things. <laughs> what, what was that for you as a kid? That that's why you always leave a note. What was? What, how did your? How did that manifest itself in your family? Like that's why we always dot dot dot. Um, in my family we have something similar called Toothpick Man. Toothpick Man, uh, that sounds okay. creepy. Which sounds creepier than I intend. <laughs> but it's basically all the, the stories that my dad would tell us as warnings of why we shouldn't do certain things like swim after eating or don't chew on a toothpick because you're going to choke on it, which is hence Toothpick Man. And in our, it basically we kind of I see. spun that this, all these stories happened to the same guy in my dad's <laughs> life. It was Toothpick Man. He just made all sorts of bad decisions. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's... He sure did. <laughs> most, most of those cautionary tale things uh, when I was growing up came from my, my grandmother. Uh, I, my parents were divorced and so uh, my dad worked all day and sometimes he worked graves. So I spent most of my days with my grandparents. Uh, and my grandmother was like, uh, always perpetually like paranoid about everything. So like, don't get close to that bee because it could be a killer bee and it could sting you and then you'll die. Or uh, be careful when you're walking home from wow. school because somebody might drive up to you and ask you to get into their car and then you'll get into their car and then they'll steal you away. Or like, I mean, literally anything she could, any topic she could spin off a, like a worst case scenario, series of, of unfortunate events, like nightmare. Uh, and so I was like perpetually like just, freaked out about the world around me um, for a long time uh, until I sort of like retrained my brain to not be. Um, This is also while I was in Catholic school, Um, which I think that probably has some sort of a correlation there too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Very, very likely. Very likely. (laughs) Ours was um, don't leave the door open. Like, and it was often associated with like, I am not trying to air condition all of whatever city we were living in. Like, I don't want to air condition all of Tarpon Springs. Close the door. But it's also like close the door so the animals don't get out. Or close the door so we don't run out of milk. Or like <laughs> non sequitur stuff. That's why you close the door. Like, and I guess it was every, I guess in that case, it was probably the, the refrigerator door. I didn't listen very well as a kid, apparently. <laughs> this is making sense now, 30 some odd years later. <laughs> well, like leaving things open and leaving things ajar, I think that's, yeah. There's a lot of symbolism yeah. there for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> like we're gonna run out um, of milk if the door's open <laughs> <laughs> it is the lid off <laughs> <laughs> well just like the finishing the finishing touches of putting things back and shutting things yeah so the nursery is pretty much complete except for the air vent and the trim still okay. yeah inside the outside that is still seems, drywall that seems like you've accomplished a lot then pretty darn happy with it yeah. Not that I know what, over panty outside. what finishing an air vent even involves. Well, <laughs> just just like, screwing like the... installing, yeah. Oh, well, okay. no, there's not even one in the bedroom at all. So I have to get up oh. in the attic. And, oh, good. So, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, and it's not like it's, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pleasant out right now. So that room's not going to get too warm, but when it gets to summer, we're going to need an air vent in there. Yeah. Okay. I so you've, install got, you've got a few months lead time. <laughs> <laughs> it's Florida. So I've got another six to eight days. Yeah. <laughs> Florida. <laughs> um, are, I wonder if the pygmy effect has something to do with like climate at all. Chris, your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> now the weather. <laughs> yeah, now the weather with Chris. <laughs> We're not rusty at this at the all. The only, the, yeah, the only reason why, I, why it sounds like it might have anything at all to do with weather is because of the word effect, I think. I don't think that it has anything to do with the weather. Oh. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine, like, uh, uh, on the Weather Channel, like they're like gesturing to the map, and it, what you'll see pushing southward here is the Pygmalion effect, right? Like, no, that's that's clearly yeah. not what this is. No, is it, Allison? <laughs> is it weather related? weather related? Okay. Although, again, mm. I wish it kind of were. Now, maybe that'll be my next rabbit hole to go down for a future topic. Oh man, weather would be interesting. So how, it's too show close how to space. We are. It is. It is rather close to space <laughs> and soccer. Oh man. I, um, I, uh, it was a little breezy yesterday, so we got a kite out in the backyard. And the the Pygmalion, due to the Pygmalion effect, the uh, kite got swept up in the wind and it disappeared. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's, if it's like a physics thing. Like there's like some of like a lift effect on triangular right, shaped the, items the, attached the, to strings. Yeah. So, so, okay, let's go down that. that. So if, pyg, if pygmy means small... And it's a physics thing, right. and it, it would be the opposite of lift. It would be like it would be like pull. It would be like the big million effect would be like when you try to fly your kite and it goes straight down. <laughs> Maybe the physics is weird, like because they talk about like air is a fluid, so that's why airplanes work, which is balderdash clearly, right? But <laughs> Maybe the million effect I mean, is just maybe... another a fancy term for nosedive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Roger, Roger. We're going into a Pygmalion effect. <laughs> Tailspin. <laughs> oh man. Oh, you're about to you're about to hear some great sounds of nature. The uh, the dump truck emptying the dumpster. Excellent. Yeah. Well, while the dumpster is emptying the the dumpster, dump truck is emptying the dumpster. <laughs> Self-emptying uh, dumpsters. There we, we need go. more of them. I'm, I won't lie. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I hope that was a satisfying, like, coming yeah. through this tiny microphone as it was sitting here. Yeah, I know. It was pretty good. <laughs> and scare the crap yeah. out of that bird, too. Yeah, he's not happy about it. She's not happy about it. <laughs> or they are, are not they're happy they're about not it. Happy now they're, they're swarming. Yeah. I might yeah. have to call on a, an acquaintance to provide nature sound effects in my apartment. <laughs> or my neighbor. Oh, no, these aren't acquaintances of mine. I, we, I mean, like, we, I haven't, I'll meet them after the call. Yeah. They can we'll work. be on a first name basis. This is more important right now. So the Pygmalion I mean, effect. Have we gotten anywhere close, Allison? Have we gotten even, like, um, touched on it a little bit? Surprisingly... Like vaguely, actually, you kind of did in a way that I didn't see coming from the original pick me, <laughs> pick me from the Latin. Um, the Pygmalion effect. So from, it's a phenomenon from, where uh, higher expectations lead to an increase in performance. Uh, what? So, so kind of on the right track with the fish thing. <laughs> Being limited in space, it's named after the Greek myth of Pygmalion, who was a sculptor who fell in love with a statue that he carved. Um, not quite sure the connection there. Oh. Uh, but here's an interesting thing that I We've learned. all written code like that, though. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> an interesting thing I learned <laughs> from it is that the opposite of the Pygmalion effect is the Gollum effect, which is Whoa. That lower expectations lead to lower performance. Wow, I like the Pygmalion effect. Or, so is it, 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 it is a theory or it is a proven thing? Uh, it's a work in progress, I would say. So it's like, they've done studies, but and mostly in education settings. 
Uh, but obviously it's a little, there's like so many factors that I think it's kind of difficult to prove. Uh, and also because people don't want to test the Gollum effect on their kids. Uh, so <laughs> hard to oh. test. But, this, but they've done educational studies basically where they've told teachers at the beginning of the year that these certain students are expected to particularly excel. And then at the end of the year, on test scores and stuff, they've noticed that that is indeed the case. And so there's all sorts so of- So it's an accepted truism. Generally, but I think it's also, I don't know, it's, 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 most of the studies seem to have been done with children. And so I think it's also hard to say because I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of application with like class and social status as well. Uh, as far as expectations and how this could be applied more broadly as far as in the educational system, especially. Uh, so like, I don't know. The subject is aware of these, these uh, higher expectations? No. So like the, the student is aware or the, the instructor or the person the that, is, that has the expectation? Yeah. Huh. So huh. the student okay, so is not quite what I thought, yeah. Free floating. Not free floating, but the student is just there as a like student. A fish. Yeah, just like a fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and That's also, it's like, who's to, who's to say how the teacher uh, represents those expectations? Yeah, to me, this seems like a perfectly reasonable thing and, and seems kind of, um, yeah, it seems like it makes total sense. Yeah, um, both, but, both, yeah, both, yeah, sides, both the Pygmalion and the, the Gollum, Gollum uh, yeah. effect. I think that I... I mean, Gollum effect is sort of like a, just a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, both of them are self-fulfilling prophecies. Like you have this idea and then you just make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely, I definitely feel well, like I've been, I've been in camp. both places. You're right. Abraham Lincoln. What? Abraham Lincoln? Sorry. <laughs> yes, that's, who, that's who said that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what I read on the internet. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Chris. So keep going. <laughs> I was just saying, I, I, I know that I've been in, uh, in both places, done both things for different things. I had a, um, in uh, junior high and going into high school, uh, I decided that I was not uh, fantastically smart and therefore I didn't try as hard. I didn't have as high expectations of myself as I had previously. I didn't I just like, well, I, you know, I just, it's just fine. I'm just not like this top five of the class. So that's fine. I'll just go through. And then, uh, and I, and, and so I, you know, was middling ish. I mean, top upper middling. And then I took an AP English class and I was like really good at it. Um, I was like, whoa, that's weird. Uh, I'm not that smart. Why am I good at AP English? <laughs> Why is this really interesting to me? Um, and then that sort of, I mean, I guess that kind of flips the other switch, right? So, um, yeah, it's definitely a, a phenomenon that I am, that I could say that I have experienced and, and I feel like all Gosh. of my code is, is Pygmalion effect. <laughs> it's great. Um, this, this strikes me as like why, why um, standardized testing can be dangerous, right? Yeah. Because like tacitly you're telling children like, well, you know, you're in the 40th percentile. Oh, fuck that. Like that's according to this, this, this one test on this one day at this one moment in time when who knows what was going on and with your brain chemistry and at your, your home life and on and on. Like it's such a, such a dangerous, dangerous thing to compartmentalize. I, I mean, well, I, and I, I made a, I made sort of but, a rule to myself geez. never to study for tests. Like yeah. literally this, I mean, and like, I, it, it was like, well, if I don't know the thing, then why is staying up all night the night before going to help me if I don't know it? Like the test is supposed to be a test of like how much I know. So I should either know it or not. And I generally did pretty good on tests. And I mean, I, I thought for the most part, they reflected what I had learned, if I had learned the thing or if I didn't. The only time that that, that wasn't true is when I was taking psychology uh, my first year in college. Um, and she like had a partic particular like study method uh, where basically you, you like cram the crap out of the last like section, last unit, whatever, uh, the night before and write all these notes. 
And so I did it because it's psychology and because it was sort of like a psychological experiment to see if this thing works. Um, and I did really, really well on those tests because, uh, because of the cramming and then like, but like, because of the cramming, like I didn't remember, I mean, I remembered some of it afterwards, but like, it was, it was really interesting how like, like the stuff that I took away that I remember now from the psychology, none of that stuff was from the test. It was like Freud and Jung and seeing a brain in the classroom that had had a stroke. Uh, that's what I remember from that class. I, I feel like, um, that, I mean, that's why I enjoyed college I'm, as, as a proud college dropout. Um, <laughs> like I, you know, uh, classes that I found interesting, um, <clears throat> like were the classes that I studied more for because the material and like the application of was super interesting to me. And I did well in those classes because it was interesting. And the classes that I didn't do well in were, you know, classes that I'm like, I don't really know this stuff and I don't find it interesting to learn more about it. So shockingly, Maybe in that case, it was like Pygmalion Gollum effect internalized, and I had no awareness of, but my self-expectation was, I'm not gonna do great in this because I'm not interested in it. And that manifested itself in, um, well, me not doing great. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, the, the thing that I got out of, huh. out of going to, to college, uh, I mean, I went to a, a school where, I could, where we could create our own major and our own design our own curriculum to an extent. So basically the classes that I took, except for my first semester, because my first year I went to uh, City College of San Francisco, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, and, and then I transferred into this, this university uh, after that in my sophomore year. So my first semester is like, okay, well, I'm probably going to be going to like a, a you know, two year college and then transfer into a four year college to, to finish up. So I'll probably should get like these requirements and stuff. But that only accounted for the first semester and then I inherited money. Um, from a distant relative that was going to pay for college. So then I was like, fuck it. Uh, so my second semester was all just, I'm going to take a bunch of stuff that I like. So I took like photography. I took, I continued the, the English class that I was taking because I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I took, uh, yeah, photography and uh, film and like all this just this stuff that was just like, you know, fun. And, uh, oh, I took a, uh, maybe this was my first semester. I took a really interesting uh, uh, political science class. That was fascinating. Um, because it was all about how the forefathers didn't trust each other and hated it, everything. Um, it was awesome. And, and then, and then when I was in college, like the stuff that I took, like, it wasn't like, we didn't have like re required course trajectory. It was like, you know, you make a case for whatever you're going to take or not take. So, um, basically I was taking stuff that I liked. I didn't have those classes where like, I just, I don't like this. I'm not interested in the subject. I, all the stuff that I was taking for the most part was stuff that I was interested in. That's why I was taking it. So yeah, I, I didn't really have like, what that. examples would that would be for me. Yeah. But do you like think English for me was one of those that I Oh, I was gonna say in those situations, that was all internal motivation based, not from a teacher, right? Gary like? is nodding his head. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I know this is like compelling audio content as I think. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that I had much interaction with those professors in the courses I wasn't interested in that would lead to any kind of external expectations. And maybe that maybe there was no expectation because I had no interaction with them. It's so a deep they, rabbit hole, maybe Allison. Maybe they didn't put forth any expectations in that environment, regardless of who you were, like for any student, maybe. And but I mean, like, yeah, for them. Freshman and sophomore level, it was probably just a job, right? Oh, I got to do these classes before I can do like the fun stuff I want to teach anyway, right? I have to like pump these uh, student ID numbers through my, you know, make sure that they show up and turn in some homework and pass an exam every once in a while. So you're probably right. There probably were like zero expectations. Like, I expect you to not need a lot from me as a professor. I have more interesting things to do. <laughs> and that would be totally fair. I mean, if that was their expectation, like if I were in those shoes, I don't know. Yeah. I don't really do the repetitive thing though. Like I can't imagine teaching a course like semester after semester. I'd be a terrible professor. Like what, what are you doing? You're not going to teach that. I don't feel like I had that experience with my professors at all. For the most part. I mean, I don't think that they, that they were, had no expectations of, of us as students. Um, I will say though that, uh, um, sort of an internalized Gollum effect, uh, led me to not try to do uh, theater in college. Um, even though I had done it all four years through high school because 
as I was graduating from high school, my drama teacher says, you know, don't ex- like expect to, expect to fail w- when you continue on because it gets much harder the further on in, in theater that you go. And so I actually, um, my first year at City College, uh, there was a play, I don't remember what the play was. And I, um, I think it was a musical. It must've been a musical because we were, you were expected to um, sing a song, have a song prepared and sing it. Um, and I had done musicals, but I didn't have a song prepared. And there's like, oh, it's fine. Because if you don't have a song, just sing like happy birthday or something. And so like, so for auditions, like here I am seeing like happy birthday on stage in like not very, <laughs> not very impressively. And like, I get like fourth chorus member or something like some bullshit. And it's like, well, I mean, if that's really all I can expect. And I was like, you know, leading like in this stuff in high school and directing and doing all sorts of interesting things. And if the best that I can expect is fourth chorus member, then I've got better things to do with my time. <laughs> Man, I was fourth chorus member in Once Upon a Mattress in college, and it was fantastic it was the time of my life. <laughs> I was proud to be fourth chorus member. <laughs> Lenses are interesting. I mean, I didn't I, have like a any kind of like acting. I mean, other than like you know the stuff you have to do in elementary school. I certainly, didn't do it in high school. So it was. I did uh, do a. Um, I did do a play fun. that a friend of mine. And dance. <laughs> well, no one can dance <laughs> um i did do a play oh no there friend... were people that could dance i mean <laughs> compared to how i danced <laughs> i looked better in tights though i did do a i did do a play that a friend of mine wrote that was an adaptation of uh william blake's marriage of heaven and hell um where uh marriage of heaven and hell is like this whole internalized uh struggle of this guy who's experiencing all these like demons uh but it's really his own internal demons whatever so so we externalized that and the demons that he was interacting with were other actors that were sort of interchangeable um and so we were all sort of like wearing the same thing but we're different people and like and and in the background um was like documentary footage of like um like both sort of pastoral views of you know like uh, like great open spaces and also like industrialized uh, uh, like farm farming type stuff or like you know that the scene where you've got the chicks going through the um, machine into the, like the spinning thing like where it's just like chicks being dumped into the big machine like like stuff like that uh, in the background as he's like struggling with holes so that was that was really fun that was actually the only real um, acting that I had done in all of college I, I but I really that was awesome I was freaking fantastic i was um one of my jobs in college was um was uh worked in the theater so the theater tech for like outside groups that came in um which is great i mean it was like a job you show up you'll knock the doors you generally turn on the lights in the sound system and put on a microphone if necessary and unmute it but occasionally we had some fun stuff and, um, like we had this trombone player came through and she did octophonic like sound as cued by her trombone um, so she had like, she would play certain frequencies on her trombone that would cue different hmm. accompaniment out of different speakers. So we had to like, we had to set up like a, a channel surround system out of the stuff we had between two theaters to make her thing work. And it was all run from this computer. I remember being just like so baffled and blown away that this whole thing could function. Um, and it was an amazing performance. I, I, I've yet to see anything anywhere near it. It was bizarre, but it was also, um, really easy to get like lost in this like circular thing of sound that was happening and it was all trombone <laughs> um which i don't know i mean i i, I didn't think a trombone was a beautiful instrument but after that i did mm. oh good we reached the part of the show where gary panics yes we reached <laughs> the part of the show where gary panics and uh nice. we get some questions that we have to answer <laughs> Just seems like good timing wait, wait, wait. because we've already gone yeah. way off the Pygmalion effects. <laughs> was there anything else? I, I feel like we covered it pretty well there for a little bit. I mean, at least an internalized version of it. No, we, we kind of went off. It was good, though. I like the conversation. It's good to be with you folks again. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. It's good to feel appreciated <laughs> after you almost broke up with us. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, to jump off of something that you, I think, mentioned before, one of my questions will be, uh, if you were going to teach a class on a regular basis on a topic, what subject would it be? 
that Theater. actually that actually interests you because you said Theater. you'd be a verbal professor. I would I would totally teach theater. That yeah. would be the thing that I would teach. Um, yeah. To a certain I, I, age level, or just doesn't matter. Uh, I don't think I could do less than high school. I've always I've always oh. thought about being a teacher, and I've always like the where where my line is is like high school and above. <laughs> Like, well, I think that, the, I think the subject matter you could tackle in theater really elevates once you reach a certain age too, yeah. which is helpful. Gary, yeah. Um, well, I'm glad you put in that caveat as far as aging, because I'm like, ah, oh, I wouldn't want to teach like college age. Um, but like primary um, technology, like specifically like programming, mm -hmm. because there's always that like realization and um, like there's no limits. So the questions that are asked are just insane and, um, and fun. And, you know, like it's, yeah, challenging, challenging. Okay, next question. Do you collect anything? This is where we find out your secret hoarding. I collect human souls. Knew it. Okay. <laughs> and Gary collects salt and pepper shakers and that's why we're the perfect team. <laughs> What do you keep souls in? <laughs> jars. <laughs> Canning jars. Mace, yeah, mason jars. Because yeah. obviously. I, yeah. That was a logical answer. I don't know why I even asked the question. Like, what did I expect? Of course. <laughs> Duh. Where else would you keep souls? <laughs> Silly question. Um, I collect... Um, this is funny because this question was asked on um, the Freakonomics podcast years ago. I guess it's a regular thing on the Freakonomics podcast. I listened to the episode where they um, interviewed um, Boris, what's his face, the former something of London, mayor, governor, president. Oh, yes, Boris, what's his face? I'm well familiar with Boris, what's his face. <laughs> this is, real, this is really, uh, really nice stuff, huh? Um, Boris Johnson, uh, and he, they asked this question, and, and his response was like, cigar boxes. And I thought that was like the most – like lame thing I'd heard. I mean, the rest of the episode was kind of weird. Um, so this is a fitting question, I guess, for this <laughs> series. Um, I, I collect obscure, not obscured, international string instruments. Um, mostly, uh, mostly uh, Central and South American, but um, that's probably it. I How many stories. do you have? Um, well, like a half dozen, so it's not a large collection. Well, it doesn't need to be. It, it's not the size of the collection. It's how many <laughs> instruments you enjoy. Because you, I imagine that you dabble in all of them as well, right? I do. I do. And my you favorite just, right now you don't is... don't just look at them. You, like, mess around with them. Yeah, there's this thing called a charango, which is from um, the Peru area, Peru-ish. I guess it's, it was originally made out of an armadillo shell. So, like, the, the bowl is now, like full hand carved wood block, but kind of in the shape of an armadillo shell. Um, and it's sort of tuned like a ukulele with a, with a, like all the strings are doubled, but there's 10 strings instead of eight as one would expect because the, I don't know, one of the other strings is also, it's a, it's a weird, loud, funky little thing. It's fun to play. I don't uh, in, collect many things actually anymore because I used to, I mean, I still, I'm staring right now at my, at my sports card collection from like when I was you know, a kid and I've yet to do anything with them still. Uh, I had a comic book collection for a long time and I got rid of most of those. I actually do have a collection of wired magazines uh, because I just can't bring myself mm. to throw them away. Um, yeah. I probably do actually. You know how they hogs. Like, <laughs> you know how they, you know how you used to be able to get like oh get the Rolling Stone magazine from your birthday from like the day of your birth and um, I probably do actually have Wired magazines for the months that both of my kids were born, which I, is a thing, I guess. Anything can be old, a thing. Old Wired has like a real, um, I don't know, like feel to it, right? Like uh, like old Wired magazines were really really interesting to read now. And, Site, you know, and some of the stuff that didn't happen, some stuff that did, and like players in the industry, and I don't, yeah, yeah, I like Wired. I liked it more when I was older. When it was older, 
I liked it more in the future. What does that even mean? <laughs> Alice, what do you mean? I liked it more when I was older. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I meant. <laughs> uh, do you sleep with closet doors open or closed? That's a trick question because... Uh, if you have a closet. <laughs> that's a trick question because uh, our closet does not have a closet door. It's yeah, that, in, it's, that uh, in itself is an interesting choice. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not like our choice. It's, it's just the way that it was built didn't have, it doesn't have a door. It's, we have this really weird L-shaped uh, bedroom. Um, it's, it's like the biggest room in the entire house. Uh, and it's built in this upstairs edition that uh, was built about uh, 20 years ago uh, in this really old house that we have now. Uh, and there's just a part of it. So part of the L shape, uh, the long part of the L shape is just at the end of it is, is the corner of the house. And on the other side of the closet is the bathroom. So it's this big walk-in closet area, um, which there was no door, except that there's a sliding door from the closet into the bathroom for some reason. <laughs> so I guess the idea is like you could be taking a shower sneak it out of the bathroom. straight into the into the closet to get dressed or something. I don't know. I, I do. You should stop for a towel first. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Are they wood floors oh. or carpeted? carpeted? Gary's anxiety is peaking now because we have less than a minute. <laughs> I close my kids' doors. I leave the closet door in our bedroom open. I, I, there's no rhyme or reason. It just <laughs> seems right. I don't know. It's just scheduling. So, Al Allison, what do you collect? Uh, feels. Okay. I don't know. I don't collect anything, I don't think. Books, I can tell from the stuff from the shelf. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably just a small part of the collection. It's probably like an entire room dedicated to books uh, off camera. I, I try to keep it to two bookshelves because this apartment is not very large. <laughs> we, but that means you need to rotate. We, or we ramble. We should say goodbye because we get cut off. But I also think that that's probably a door to a larger room with more bookshelves. <laughs> that's true. Yes. You do you um, lift a VHS and then it flips and then I go into my mystery mansion. Yeah. Yeah. Truth Which is, is actually true. that's not shocking at all. No. It's very par for the course for where me. I have, where I fish that will only grow to a certain size because their tank is only a certain size. This is just me. At One day I will launch them into space. My non mansion. <laughs> All right. I, yeah. There was a SpaceX launch Tuesday at twelve thirty in the morning, and I was I was thinking, great, like a night launch will be fantastic. I can look out the window and see it while I'm carrying the baby around. I was sleeping. I like I thought for sure I'll catch this night launch. It'd be so cool, but it just didn't work out. And on that sad note, <laughs> we shall sign off. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the form on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz. Thank you.